Hey, everybody, if you're in the New York area this coming Monday, May the 22nd, I will be co-hosting a screening of uh, Very Semi-Serious, which is a HBO documentary film about the cartoon department at the New York Magazine. It uh, follows the life of the editor of the cartoon department, Bob Mankoff, and, and a bunch of other cartoonists and his personal life as well. It's a very, very fun and funny documentary. In fact, this screening on Monday night kickstarts my screening series called Docularius. And we're going to be at DCTV, who's co-hosting the event. DCTV is at 87 Lafayette Street, just a block or two south of Canal Street in Manhattan in a converted firehouse. They've been there forever. They're old friends of Film Wax and myself. And I'm very, very excited that we'll be doing the screening and relaunching the uh, Docularius film series for the low price of uh, $6 for members and $10 for non-members. If that weren't enough, uh, you get to meet four cartoonists from The New Yorker, including Bob Mankoff himself. He'll be there on Monday night at DCTV along with Leanna Fink, Emily Flake, and Mort Gerberg. So, uh, again, doors at 6.30, screening at 7. We'll be there having a good time. And, you know, listen, bring a sketch. Could it hurt to submit it right there? I mean, you know, so why not get some feedback? And then we'll be hanging out and have a reception after the Q&A. So, again, join me Monday night, May 22nd, at DCTV, 87 Lafayette Street in Manhattan. And now, on with the show. Hey, everybody, new sponsor for the show, Magic Drop. Magic Drop is a music licensing business based in Brooklyn, New York, which represents an eclectic roster of bands and composers licensing their music for use in films, TV, and beyond. Magic Drop works directly with clients to find songs or instrumentals from a catalog of a thousand plus tracks by artists with distinctive developed voices. Magic Drop offers competitive rates and festival licenses for independent filmmakers. Visit magicdropmusic.com or email contact at magicdropmusic.com for more information. Again, that's Magic Drop. I welcome them to the podcast. Welcome, everyone. This is Adam Shartoff, your host of Film Wax Radio. You're listening to episode 407. I'm still so geeked, so happy that all my technical issues have been ironed out. You know, again, a couple of weeks there, it was touch and go with a new website that the show's feed is on. But now go to RooftopFilms.com and check out what a beautiful website they've got. My show's on the blog area. you got to visit the schedule because this weekend, starting tomorrow night, March uh, Friday, March the 19th, begins the official 21st season of Rooftop Films. And I'm, I'm really plugging away because uh, i got to tell you, every year they start their summer series off with This Is What We Mean by Short Films, which is a collection of, of outstanding short films. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of them again. I did on the last episode. I do want to mention uh, one friend of mine, Nathan Truesdell, will be there with his short. It's called Balloon Fest. So a uh, special shout out to uh, to Nathan. Congratulations on that. The event will take place at the Old American Can Factory, 232 3rd Street in Brooklyn. Doors at 8 o'clock. Live music by, again, I'm not going to try to pronounce this, I-N-N-O-V. G-N-A-W-A. Film begins at 9 o'clock, then at 10.30, there's an after party. Sponsored by Corona Extra Tank Array, Fever Tree, Tonic, and Frisione. Rooftop Films. You can go to rooftopfilms.com for tickets. Anyway, and then on Saturday night, the 20th of, of May, there's a free screening of Band-Aid, Zoe Lister-Jones' doc, uh, new film. By the way, Zoe Lister-Jones was on this very podcast. Check out episode number 323 with Zoe when she uh, released her film Consumed. Well, this is a new film. It's called Band-Aid. It's about a band, and then they're going to perform afterwards. And it's going to take place at the House of Vans, which is at 25 Franklin Street in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Doors at 7. Film begins at 8.30, 10 o'clock. Post-screening Q&A with Zoe and Adam Pally. And then 10.30, live music from Zoe and Adam uh, it says here, in the event of rain, the show will be held indoors at the same location. No outside alcohol is permitted. Listen, RSVP right now. Go to Rooftop Films and take care of business. In the meantime, that's your Friday and Saturday. Take Sunday off. Take a breather. And then Monday night again, like at the top of my show, I said, come to my screening of Very Semi-Serious. Don't, you know, if you go to HBO with your parents' login and watch it that way, first of all, you're not 
it, you're not going to see it on a big screen uh, surrounded by other people laughing. And secondly, the cast is going to be at my screening, for God's sake. Mm-hmm. So come on down to DCTV again. I can't tell you enough how much I want to meet people that are listening to my show. And I'll be there doing my Q&A with Bob Mankoff, Emily, Liana, and Mort. Okay, now on with uh, episode number 407. Uh, what do we got here? We have uh, two uh, uh, two segments today. I'm not going to talk at great length about them because you can just listen to them. One is uh, Steve James is, uh, listen, uh, I love Steve James. I love his films. This is one of the most talented documentary filmmakers out there today. You know, there was from Stevie, where he was like a big brother to this young man who was a, a troubled inner city Chicago, I believe. I'm, I'm just riffing because I could have some little factual errors. But then to Hoop Dreams, okay, when I saw Hoop Dreams in the 90s, I was blown away. Who would think, you know, like 25 years later or so, I would be like friends You know, when I say friend, I don't mean like I go over for dinner, but we're friends. Like we hang out, we chat whenever Steve's in town. And and I uh, can't believe that uh, I just take it for granted at this point. But this is the one of my favorite documentaries and, and one of America's favorite documentaries ever. Hoop Dreams, for God's sake. The Interrupters, unbelievable, right? Life itself about Roger Ebert. And there's a bunch more just on and on. Check out his entire slate of films there's not a there's not a bad egg in the bunch and now he has a new documentary called abacus small enough to jail anyway uh i went down to the museum of chinese in america which is in chinatown here in new york city yet just yesterday and i met with uh, steve and the subjects of his film the sung family which is a chinese american family uh they own and operate a, a chain of small banks called abacus for the chinese american community in various place spots and they were uh, actually prosecuted I, i'm not going to tell you more about it because you're going to find out at length in this coming uh segment about this 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 documentary which is opening on tomorrow friday the 19th in theaters in new york and la and, el- and elsewhere so and we'll have all that information on our show notes Steve was on episode number 223 for a nice long, I think we had an hour-long chat right around the time Life Itself was coming out. Uh, And so I welcome Steve back on the show. I'm very excited to have him back on, finally, lo, all these episodes later. And he is being joined by the Sung family and the um, father, matriarch, Thomas Sung, as well as three of his daughters, Vera, Jill, and Chantrell Sung. And so I'm very excited about that. And of course, Steve himself. So that's coming up in a moment. And then I am finally able to post this episode of my conversation with this young filmmaker named Cameron Bruce Nelson, who I spoke to almost, I I think it was about two years ago. I think it was two years ago. I, I was a juror at the Nashville Film Festival two years ago. And I spoke to this young guy about his film called Some Beasts. And um, finally, the, the, there's going to be a screening tonight as I post this show. I'm trying to get it up in time so people have an opportunity to go see Some Beasts at the Spectacle Cinema, Spectacle Theater in Williamsburg. Um, and uh, and support this young filmmaker. And also, the cast of this film is are friends of mine, uh, some of whom have been on the show. The cast includes Frank Mosley, who will be in an upcoming episode. I'm going to wait until, I think, the show, until Some Beasts hits uh, platforms, digital platforms. Then I'm going to post a couple of other interviews from the film, including one with Frank Mosley, the actor and filmmaker, Frank Mosley, good friend of mine, as well as Heather Kafka, who has been on the show before and who I have another episode ready to go as soon as uh, Some Beast again hits the those uh, plat- platforms. So uh, I'm not going to tell you much about it now. In between the uh, introduction to the second segment, I will come back and I'll give you a little bit of uh, information about that. But it's again, it is playing tonight at the Spectacle Theater, which is located at 124 South 3rd Street near Bedford Avenue. The cost for this screening, $5. How do you beat that? Tickets are available. Go to the Spectacle website and purchase tickets for some Beasts, which again I saw at Nash, the Nashville Film Festival, and it's finally having its New York premiere this uh, evening. Now let's get into my first segment here again with Steve James and the Sung family around this new documentary. Again, it's called 
Abacus, no, small enough to jail. Opening tomorrow, Friday. Today, we are announcing the indictment of a federal savings bank on mortgage fraud, securities fraud, and conspiracy. A federally chartered bank that has been catering to the Chinese immigrant community since 1984. If you are going to pick on a bank, a family-owned company, wedged between a couple of noodle shops in Chinatown is about as easy a target as you could possibly pick. When I was a lawyer, there was no bank owned by Chinese and serving the Chinese. When I walk around here, I feel very much at home. This is a very uh, tasty uh, noodle shop. That's always special. That's the butt. <laughs> when we were children, my dad was excited about this bank he was going to start. We serve people who've never even dealt with the banking system before. This whole ordeal began in 2009. One of our loan officers stole money. He was lying all over the place. He was running a money laundering operation. I fired him that day. They went straight to their regulator, and they told them about it. The DA's office started asking us questions. Wait a minute, maybe we're the target. If that prosecution goes through, that bank is going to go out of business. Although this is David versus Goliath, they're a whole family of lawyers. We spent a lot of time investigating and ended up absolutely convinced that the loan department was corrupt through and through. They routinely falsified mortgage documents. Reporters in this town were treated to this extraordinary photo opportunity. This almost Stalinist. We're at the Museum of Chinese in America at MOCA, right here in Chinatown, in New York City, with filmmaker Steve James returning to my podcast. When last we met, it was in a hotel room. Let's just leave it there. We had a nice conversation. And then I'm, I'm pleased to also be joined by some of the subjects of the film, the Sung family. And uh, it's okay, Mrs. Sung, she dropped something. It's okay, no problem. And uh, I'll introduce y'all, and then we'll get into it. Chantrell and Jill and Vera. Yes. Song, got it. And, and Father, uh, Father Thomas is around somewhere. He's going to maybe drop in in a little while. So we'll, we'll start. The name of the film is Abacus, Small Enough to Jail. What, Abacus is, well, let's just get right into it. Since you're holding the mic, Vera, let's start. What is Abacus, by the way? Abacus? Is I'm playing devil's advocate. Okay. Or devil's abacus. Okay. (laughs) What is abacus? Abacus, objectively, Mm -hmm. is an object. It's a calculator. (laughs) The oldest computer created, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then subjectively, it was used as a name to name or bank. My father chose it um, because he felt it represented a certain amount of history and precedent and gravitas to the financial institution that he created, Abacus Bank. And it's located in Chinatown in New York. Yes. Where it has been for how long? It's over 30 years uh-huh. in existence. Um, and we have six branches, a couple in, um, oh. two, one, two in Chinatown, one in Chinatown, mm-hmm. one in Philadelphia, one in Flushing, one in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and one in Edison, New Jersey. In Edison, really? Yes. Mm. We're basically, where there, there's, uh, yes, there's a concentration. There's a Chinese American community yeah. there? Yes. Okay. My dad's brother lived there for many years. I grew up going to Edison. I didn't. All my childhood. <laughs> oh, you did. Okay. So, for all I know, drove right by it. You're right. Although I'm, I'm assuming they they came later in, in the in the picture. Some of those branches. Yes, they but, did. You know. Yeah. That's but the point is, is right. It's it's been this establishment, this institution, serving the Chinese American community for decades. Yes. Right. Over three decades. Yes. Right. And then in 2008, we had a bit of a financial meltdown in this country, to say the least, where several financial institutions were clearly playing with our money and, and breaking, potentially breaking a lot of laws and also needed bailouts, everything, right? And then out of all that and all those major banks that were participating in that, the government went after one bank or ended up litigating against one bank. Right. Is that what, fair way? It was your, your bank. Yes. <laughs> Hence the film. Right. So, Steve, uh, I know that this was brought to you by, by your friend Mark here, right? This this story, friend. I don't song. I don't know if I'd use the word friend. Um, Acquaintance? No, no. <laughs> he, of course, he, yes, he's a friend. Yes, and a, and a colleague. So you found out about this story, or he brought it to your attention. And what was it that was so compelling to you? Um, you guys are clearly well. I've always liked Chinese food. Story. Um, number Fair one. Enough. Um, no, uh, what was compelling about it? <laughs> you said you're going to add it, so. Um, <clears throat> Me. Yeah, oh. So I don't make mistakes, not <laughs> oh, you. <okay. laughs> um, what was compelling about it was just hearing 
initially about, you know, when Mark first talked to me about it, he <laughs> said, you know, I know this family in New York. I've known them for 10 years. They have this bank. They're the only bank being criminally prosecuted right. connected to the 2008 mortgage crisis. And I'm like, what? And, and they're a small community bank. And he said, and, you know, I really think they're innocent. And he started to give me some of the details about how they had self-discovered some low-level fraud going on. In the mortgage on. department. In, the, in their own mortgage the lending, department, right. how they reported it, how mm -hmm. they fired the guy, reported it, initiated their own internal investigation and got rid of a few other people. And yet the DA's office decided that the bank was in, complicit in all of this and decided to put them on trial and, and that this was this five-year ordeal. So Mark told me all this, and I was like, this just sounds insane. And then he said, and, and Matt Taibbi, in his book, The oh, Divide, right. mm -hmm. Rolling Stone. wrote about their the indictment, mm -hmm. because when the book came out, the trial had not happened, but wrote about their indictment in the introduction to his book as, as a kind of exhibit A of mm -hmm. the unequal application of justice in America. And so he said, you know, you, you, you should read that, and he gave me the book. And I, I read that chapter, and I just said, well, yeah, I, I see why this is. And, you know, on top of all of that, it was like, and no one's reporting on, I mean, I hadn't heard about it. I read the New no. York Times with some regularity, and it was right. like, I, I don't know anything about it. So right. all of that combined said, well, yeah, let's go to New York and film a little bit and see if there's a film to be done here. And clearly there was. Chantrell. <laughs> what? <laughs> why, what do, so why do, you, why do you think Cyrus Vance Jr., right? Wasn't Cyrus Vance Sr. a good guy? Wasn't he a good guy? I remember him. He was like the VP, right? He, was, he worked, he wasn't he under... Uh, the Secretary of State. Oh, he was the Secretary of State under Ford? Carter. 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 He's one of the good guys, I thought. Anyway, it doesn't mean that he's not. It doesn't mean Cyrus Vance Jr. isn't, but he doesn't get our sympathy in this. I'm wondering why, why Abacus Bank... Would, would you? Have, I mean, you guys must have a... A theory after sure. all that, sure. And we we're asked that question a lot, as if there's some sort of complicated answer. But I really think yeah. it's quite simple. It was basically an example of going after the little guy, but it was all about politics. Um, at that point, there was no other financial institution that had been charged criminally after the financial crisis, and it was like could have been like shooting fish in a barrel, but they went after. Yeah, and this was this said. was a case that we actually brought to them. Mm -hmm. um, they had initially, right. before we even um, retained an attorney to represent the bank, they had asked my sisters to come in, well, to provide documents and to come in for interviews um, to the district attorney's office to explain how the bank operated and, and so forth. Um, and so... You know, at that point, as Steve had mentioned, an internal investigation by the bank had already been conducted, um, and Continue. my sisters had hired a forensic auditor to conduct that investigation and had provided that evidence to the Manhattan DA's office, thinking that they were going to then do what's right and actually prosecute the bad guys. But mm -hmm. instead, it turned into what you now know yeah. as this story. Oh. And, and forgive, I'm asking a lot of questions as though I haven't seen the movie or know the story, but a lot of people that are listening will hopefully see the film, but maybe haven't yet. Uh, I have a question, Jill. Well, do you think the government just assumed this was going to be like just a slam dunk? Yes, I think so. I mean, I, I didn't think, I don't think they thought that they, there would be any kind of fight that's put up by us. Um, I think they also thought that as a being a bank that we would be a small bank that we would be nervous and and be concerned about um our regulatory issues with 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 having this indictment against us so mm -hmm. um i definitely i think they definitely thought that mm -hmm. that would be easy well we're being joined by the patriarch of the family it's thank you to, yeah <laughs> thank you very much thomas song yes. and so thomas um let me ask you, there's a lot of questions come to mind. But one I want to definitely ask you is, what did you think when maybe it was Mark Mitten came to you saying, I have this friend named Steve who makes films and he's interested in, is, is, was that kind of how it went? No, uh, I think it's Mark and then Mark introduced uh, uh, Stephen. Uh, hold, the, hold the mic a little closer. To, to us. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. What was your first 
thought about or feeling about a film being made about this story, especially when you had no idea how it was going to turn out? Well, uh, truthfully, we always felt that we have a uh, uh, we have been uh, unfairly prosecuted. Uh, having a recording of the events uh, to me is, is a is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I welcome the the opportunity. In fact, Steve, did you talk to him about? There's going to be an aspect to the film that might get personal, that you're going to be inside their family discussions right in the middle of that and maybe in their home, and it could get quite intimate, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we made it clear that, that we didn't just want to interview them about the case or check in with them, that we wanted to be around when, when they were um, processing, the, processing and dealing with yeah. it. I mean, you know, there, there were boundaries. Um, Jill, despite my persuasive charms, uh, did not allow us to film with her family. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I kept, I kept coming back to that, didn't I? Saying, ah, oh, come on, are you sure? Just a little bit, you know, because mm -hmm. we did want to see them apart from the office and, and the, the, you know, the, the dealing with the trial to, to some degree. Not a lot, but to some degree. But, you know, it's fine that we didn't get that, and we were totally respected um, her, her reasons for not wanting that. Uh, but, but they were very cooperative and, uh, and game for us to be there to sort of see this process that they were going through and, and sort of witness it up close, which is good because that is the heart of this film. Uh, you know, we weren't able to be in the courtroom. We tried. We weren't able to get access to the prosecution during the trial. We tried. We weren't even able to get access to the defense team during the trial, and we really tried with I'm that. Sure. So what we well, were left with, and I put that in quotes, is the family. But you know what? That really was the heart of really understanding what this was about and, and what it meant was to be with the family, and thankfully they, they, they gave us that access. What was the defense... What was their biggest concern about somehow participating in the film? Uh, I think uh, you guys should add to this, but my, my impression from our conversation with them was that they, they just felt like it was um, that they worried that any kind of film, even though the film wasn't going to come out until long after this was decided, that it, it could present some kind of problem mm. um, with us being there to record it. It could, it could in some ways undermine the confidentiality between client and, and lawyers. Honestly, I know because there's been a number of films done that have access to um, Lots, parties yeah. mm -hmm. during the trial that that really isn't a real, um, that there's ways to deal with that that's, that, you know, that, that, that would never come to pass. But we weren't able to convince them of that, and they're, they're the lawyers, so they decided that they didn't want it. Uh, you know. Well, to the film's credit, it didn't occur to me. Why isn't the defense team speaking up here? Why don't we have them in the... And, and I think, and that's good yeah. to hear, and I think part of that is because the family is so engaged right. in this process with each other sure. that um, it, it's, it, it more than fills any void there'd be there. And it's compelling, and it's different. Mm -hmm. it's different. It's different to sort of see a family going through this in the way you see that in the film, whereas typically you see lawyers involved in every yes, aspect of it. right. And it makes sense, the bank, even though it's a, financial institution it's a family business and um, you know you don't see that too often and I, it kind of brings me back to that point i glad it came up because what we see in the film also at the sort of towards the beginning is father and the founder of the bank thomas really involved in the neighborhood he's really part of the community and really visible makes himself personally liable by being visible I don't mean legally necessarily viable to the problems that may occur, but he he's there. He's taking you know ownership of of his of, of his business and of his relationships, and it's really refreshing. It's particularly difficult to watch his name being questioned and his name to be dragged through the mud like that. And I can't imagine. I was feeling so much tension and anguish, empathizing with you ladies uh, about what that must be like to see your dad. Going, and we see it in the film, what you're going through, but I don't know if you can articulate looking back uh, now a year or two when this, when this was unfolding. Um, it's hard to believe it's been two years already. Yeah. 
time really flies. But um, the pain and the anguish that you talk about mm. is very real. Each one of us, as his daughter, we each daughters, we each we don't want to disappoint him, and we also don't want to see him get hurt in any way. Just as he is very protective of us, so. Um, in going through this trial, it's very personal in mm -hmm. that sense. We knew we were fighting for the community and for the bank, um, but we also know that we were also trying to fight for something that our father had devoted his entire life, well, not his entire life, but a good part of his life in building. Mm -hmm. um, and we, de we definitely want to make sure that that legacy survives and continues. <laughs> did you have anything to add no, to no, that, Jill? I think oh. that was good. Chantrell, do you have anything to add? Uh, let's hear from yeah. Let's hear from Thomas again, uh, Mr. Sung. Excuse me. Let's hear from Mr. Sung again. You're a pretty cool character. You, you, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't think I saw you sweat once. I mean, your wife is falling apart. Your, your daughters are, are crumbling, and you know, everybody is trying to keep that their their selves together. But you, you know, look very very together through the whole time. Was there any moment uh, or moments in there where you, you really just had given up hope? Well, you know, um, as you get, as I get older, you become more immune to different uh, possible events in life. And of course, this is one of the most difficult uh, ones that we've experienced, particularly when you are almost at the retirement age, actually beyond retirement age. If you are age. beyond, I was <laughs> say. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> yeah. And you have this thing uh, coming at you. <laughs> Uh, your, your wife is, is 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 gesticulating behind you. Get I'm yeah, sorry, dear. So, so you had this thing, this uh, indictment come at you, uh, totally in in the sense that you cannot anticipate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In banking, we anticipate risks. Uh, that's part of, part of the banking uh, the bank bank's responsibility. Right. Right. We we anticipate various different risks. Uh, one of the risks uh, is um, uh, regulatory risk, uh, but really never anticipated prosecutorial risk. Mm -hmm. That's something never experienced before, mm -hmm. and it's for good reason. When the financial institution is prosecuted, indicted, that's the beginning and the end, not like a normal criminal case. It's the beginning. Mm -hmm. But daughter who did the research would tell you no bank survived the indictment. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, wow. Not, I didn't know not, more than, more, not more than three months anyway, right? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, usually the regulator either pulls the plug. Well, most of the times they pull the plug. They take away that, the, the charter. guarantee in the charter. Okay. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, and it's, then they, they work. It's almost like a pre-arranged <laughs> between it's the like regulator and the, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and the bank. Um, right. So yeah, my father's correct. It, this was completely unprecedented, and um, but we felt that he, my father's talking about risk, and I'm nodding my head vigorously because that's all I do my whole day is in my job as the bank um, president is I have to constantly assess risk, risk management. Yeah, and yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but when we looked at the risk of going to trial versus the risk of taking some a plea that was completely untrue, we felt that the risk to the institution was much greater actually was fatal if we took the plea and we felt that going to trial because us being lawyers and having some faith in the system would be able to prove ourselves was actually a risk that we should take and that was important to take did you want to add to that thomas good yeah i just want to finish the um, thoughts so yes it, 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 this this risk or prosecutorial risk it was never anticipated we know it's a horrendous risk. It's a life and death risk to be, to be indicted. But there was no choice. They want you to either go through the trial. They, don't, they, they really don't want you to go through the trial. They just want you to die. Mm -hmm. uh, but we felt that we had to move, uh, move on and defend the case. So there, in, in that respect, they took the risk away from you because there's no, no choice for us. We had to fight. But to answer your question, how is that we feel so calm about it in approaching the thing here? No, That's I just asked to, how you did. 
Yes. <laughs> 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 that that may that that may appear to be so, but but really we went through a, a lot of uh, uh, emotional up and down, a lot of uh, mm. uh, uh, agony because uh, after the indictment, uh, there were successive other uh, prosecutorial actions taken by Vance, such as freezing the bank's asset as if the bank was a ordinary criminal. That would that would have a flight risk mm-hmm. taking the mm-hmm. property in abscond, you know, mm-hmm. and but that, that's uh, hardly is the case with a federally insured institution. So we would we know we were we were on the right, but yet again we had to constantly think about what would we do if the action was brought by the DA to freeze our asset. Should we allow him to freeze our assets or a portion of our assets, uh, or should we fight it? If we fight it, are we correct Mm -hmm. as fiduciary of the bank Mm -hmm. in taking that risk? All of these things constantly go through our mind and and, 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 and Jill and and Vera's mind and so forth because they clearly was wrong in, in exerting that power to freeze a federally insured institution. And we were almost ready to give them a small amount of money. To us, it's big money. Sure. To them, it's a small amount of money, such as, what, $2 million? Yeah. You know, something, yeah, something like that. They want $6 million to freeze. But they want to put it in their own account. Not in the escrow account. <laughs> Isn't this, <laughs> you, you, you laugh. That, this is honest truth. That's amazing. Yeah, we, we said that. We said no, that, no go. We said no go. No uh, way. If you lose, yeah. if we win the case, how I, how are we going to come to ask you to give us the money back? Right. So the our regulator sort of uh, to back up us up a little bit on this this point. I would be, I believe. But anyway. They gave up on exerting that. Uh, Thank goodness. R- yeah, that risk. Anyway, I know that we have to wind down. Uh, so I just want to thank the, the Sung family for being so open and, and and sharing their story here, and to Steve James for telling the story so so sensitively and um, dramatically. I mean, it's uh, the film, which again is called uh, Atticus, the subtitle of which is "Small Enough to Jail," and it's going to be having its theatrical. This later this week, Friday, uh, the nineteenth, at the IFC Center in New York City, and at the Landmark New Art in Los Angeles. Well, it's going to be other places. It's going to be dozens of other places oh, with God, the Steve yes. James moniker. Plus, Motto Pictures, Julie, my old camp friend, Julie Goldman. You've got Motto Pictures. You've got our friends at Cartemquin Films behind go. the film. Yeah. So it's a quite a lot, a, uh, lot of powerful lot of, people behind this. <laughs> a lot of pedigree. Everybody but. The, <laughs> Do you think at your Everybody night, Cyrus Vance Jr. Do you think he's going to be coming to see the film? I think he I will. I hope he brings a big group of people I think from he, the DA, I ADA's surprised. office. There's a lot of ADAs over there, right, Chanterelle? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, Steve, you got to run. So thank you very much. It's good to see you again. And, thank, you. And, thank, you. thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank it was you. a real pleasure and honor to meet everybody here. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Museum of uh, Chinese in America. Thank you very much. Again, Cameron Bruce Nelson's film Sunbees opening tonight at uh, the Spectacle Theater in Williamsburg, 124 South 3rd Street, right off Bedford Avenue. If you haven't been to the Spectacle, go check it out. It's a nice little micro cinema. The film is, let's see, uh, Sal, played by Frank Mosley, has left modern society. He's like the contemporary Henry David Thoreau. His, so he's left modern society, his past, and his girlfriend to live off the land in remote Appalachia as a caretaker and a gardener. But is this remote living freedom? Or is it some other kind of self-imposed prison? Sal struggles with the isolation of his new job. Again, the film co-stars Lindsay Burge, who's been on the show before, and Heather Kafka, who's also appeared on Film Wax Radio and who will be in another upcoming episode. And i got to get Lindsay Burge on. By the way, I just had seen her in Nathan Silver's new film, Thirst Street. She was terrific in that. I, I, so i got to bring her back with Nathan. I think that's going to have to happen bring the two of them on back on the show it'll be like nathan's fourth or fifth time on the show and we'll bring Lindsay back on but anyway she's in this film it's called some beasts go check it out if you can't make it to tonight's screening wait and i'll keep you appraised you know connect with uh, all my social media so that way you can keep appraised i really enjoyed this film when i saw it 
Uh, you can visit somebeast.com to keep in touch and subscribe to the newsletter and keep in touch with the film so you too can see it. Now, let's go into my conversation with filmmaker Cameron Bruce Nelson. This is really great, Sal. Look at this. Yeah, I know. It's amazing what they've, what they've done with this. Look at the kale. kale. Look at this. Do you see this, Riley? Look at this. It's beautiful. Look. You can actually eat it right off. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> you, want, you want some? Yeah. Some? <laughs> it's right a passage. You're crazy. Stick that in your pocket for later. See anyone over here? Riley, come here. Me, I'll follow you. Look at this. It's snowing and look at those flowers are still in bloom. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Let's go take a look here. Going in. Ed! Hey, how you doing? Oh. Hello. Hey, hey Renee. Hey. How are you doing? Good, well, good to meet heard you. Heard a lot Thank about you. her. Hey, Riley. Riley. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, come on. Just got our first five star review oh, from uh, Verite Film Magazine, uh-huh. which is a uh, UK based publication. Oh. Where did they see it? Um, they they saw it in Nashville. Oh, so it's okay. nice oh. that uh, that we had our kind of our first Nashville review be. Such a glowing review. That is very glowing. Six, five seven, out of five stars. Yeah. We're, we're hoping it's a five out of five, not ten, right? Yes, that's yeah. correct. <laughs> <laughs> you are listening to Cameron Nelson, who is the director of Some Beasts. Is, uh, is this your first feature? This is my first feature. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Pleased with it? I am very proud of it. Oh, good. Very proud. That's nice to hear. Uh-huh. It's gone through a long, long journey. Gestation period or whatever. Yeah. I lived on the farm for three years and then moved to Texas and then wrote the script. Uh-huh. And then we spent three years making the film. Right. Um, okay, so, so, so people get your con- the context of what you're so- talking about. Um, the name of the movie is Some Beasts, right? It's having its uh, – is it a world premiere mm-hmm. here at Nashville? Uh, no, no. It's you had, kind you of a co-world it. premiere with Dallas and Nashville. Oh, it's yeah. the same, same – on the same uh, – how would you put it? Weekend or – Yeah, know. it was – Time, yeah, it was, they kind of crossed over each other. So. Yeah. We're, are we in the same time zone? Um, I'm actually not sure if – is Nashville in Eastern – is it Eastern time here? No, no, no. no, no. We're, we're one so, over, so it's Central. So, yeah, so we're Central here. All right. And then is that Dallas? Dallas what? as well. Mm-hmm. Is Dallas Central time? Mm-hmm. Okay. So the just, just to be sure, you never know, maybe on a technicality, you know, one that uh, was clearly – they play the same day? How does that work? Uh, no, code. actually, we played the 10th and the 15th okay. in Dallas, and then the 17th and 21st in oh, Nashville. Oh, no comparison. So Dallas, mm-hmm. clearly, in the, uh, the, the premiere. Yeah. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, so, And if you hear a voice in the background that belongs to producer Mark, what's your last name? A.D. Howell. Howell? Oh, A.D., excuse me. A.D., assistant director for Mark or Howell. Um, and... Um, yeah, so we're at Nashville Film Festival, and we're chatting. Let me turn that fan off, actually, that I think about it. Yeah, sure. All right, well, let's get to the little bit of the backstory of the film. It's a little warm in here. I apologize. But let's get into the backstory of the film a little bit so people know what this is. First of all, I also want to mention that uh, uh, two of your stars, starring performers, uh, have been on the po- uh, have sat for interviews for the podcast, but I have not posted them yet. And I don't know if they'll be posted before this, but I'm sure both have mentioned some beasts in the, those conversations. Uh, one with Frank Mosley, who's your lead actor. I don't think there's barely a, scene, a sh- shot without Frank in it. And uh, mm-hmm. Heather Kafka, who is his uh, love. And it takes place on, uh, well, it's, it's about, uh, I think the description that I read was very good. It was, you know, thorough, like self imposed. Well, I'm sorry, self imposed. Exile kind mm-hmm. of situation where he he's living in a is it Virginia? Tell me where it is. It's in Southwest Virginia. Okay, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. South West Virginia or South- Southwest Virginia. Southwest Virginia. Okay, in the state of Virginia. Mm-hmm. And he's uh, right, and he's a caretaker. They've got a you know during the winter for several farms, right? 
Yes. Yeah, for mm-hmm. for yeah. four farms in the film. Mm-hmm. Right. And he lives on one of them mm-hmm. in a work trade situation. Okay. And but it, it is all about his being he's not comfortable in you know, obviously on a social level. Um and so this is sort of him like but he's also pr- seems to be prone to a certain level of melancholy. Yeah. I mean, I I think what it is is that he's sort of trapped between two worlds and there is his past that he is um uh, you know, he can he can be either living in the past or sort of planning for the future, but he never really is enjoying the present. And I feel like that that's sort of what we see the inner conflict in him is that um, there's this answering machine that is almost this portal back to the to the old world. Yeah. Um, and he, it's it's almost like this constant tether uh, to him and kind of trying to pull him back, whereas he wants to move on uh, and and sort of uh, with this very intentional existence out there you know i mean when you when you want to live on the land you have to be completely 100 percent there and i feel like that was sort of the conflict of the story was that you know you have kind of this constant reminder of the past that he left behind and a past that's not completely willing to let go mm-hmm. and uh heather kafka plays uh, uh this woman in his life who is it's part of what you just described also he, she's just another component in that struggle and that conflict of whether to connect or to, to you know to really um go outside of himself and and commit to this relationship of the single mother uh, i mean she herself uh, has her own issues but she has a, a daughter you know and in a situation that she, she, she you set up as the writer where mm-hmm. she can't really just leave and go move down to the virginia so right she's up in uh she's in texas in te- oh she's down in texas excuse mm-hmm. me she's further southwest yeah so it's a it's a it's it's really great and then Lindsay bird shows up later on uh, i guess in the spring i don't know uh-huh. i don't know yeah <laughs> as one of the uh maybe the one where he's living the, the farm he's living on yes um the he sort of takes over the land a court's land right a, okay. as the caretaker and kind of continues yeah. and uh a court is the old man in the film yeah and and uh he sort of caretakes his his land and then uh Lindsay comes in and who is uh his niece in the film and also claims stake to the land so there's a little conflict over yeah. Yeah. who the rightful owner is and yes. if we can even own land and it's kind of raising those questions Lindsay also has been on the show it's nice to Lindsay was on a show she's, for a she's teacher. wonderful she's awesome yeah uh, so I think a court was the only one who's not uh, yeah <laughs> it isn't no uh, is it an unusual name it's a apostrophe C O R T mm-hmm. I believe it's French actually uh-huh. like yeah. short for having court or something like mm-hmm. that maybe it's like a maybe a, Right, it's it's, a, it's yeah. an abbreviated. Yeah, it's a core. I think is oh, usually A-Cor. how they usually say it, but a court insisted that it, that's how he goes by a court with the hard T on the end. So. Well, it, you know, it's yeah, it's one of those things which uh, we kind of bastardized it or, yeah. or <laughs> anglicized. I don't know the, the Americanized it in its pronunciation, and it makes more sense to pronounce it that way anyway. I suppose. Yeah. Who's really coming down? It's kind of nice, like for the with the with the movie. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, the little atmospheric because it's always snowing or raining um, uh, at this uh, in this part of the country at this time of the year that yes. it takes place. It's a little dreary and beautiful, mm-hmm. gothic, but 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 uh, American gothic, I should say. But really, a bit of a I don't know. I would have a hard time and struggle. I it think, sets the mood. Yeah, right. And especially in our film, like we used a lot of the landscape and the weather to sort of reflect how the character was His feeling. Internal landscape. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it was great to see. It was just one more time, Frank, uh, who listens to this show. So I don't want him to get too big ahead, but yeah. it was really refreshing because I've seen him in many movies in small roles. So it was nice to see him in, you know, to really be the lead actor in something that really optimized his talent. And you know, it was nice. Yeah, I really, I always felt like he had it in him, and I always, I mean, because he and I worked on a short film together called New Animal, and it was actually the film where he and I sort of developed that very subtle gesticulation yet it says basically like what a paragraph of exposition exposition could say sort of like in a small facial movement and Mm -hmm. i really sort of zoomed in and found that he has this ability to express subtly which is something that i really appreciate in in performances being such a big fan of you know some of the 1970s european cinema where there's not a whole lot said but there's a lot that comes across just artfully and sort of the visual expression and and um 
some of the 70s American cinema, like the like uh, Tulane Blacktop, for example, it's like, you know, talk about not very much dialogue or or you know have to go along with the with the with the story mm-hmm. um just be along for the ride and um so certainly i think yeah monty hellman uh actually is the inventor of mumblecore <laughs> 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 years before um, that's the duplass brothers or joe swamberg sure I'm, I'm, I'm monty hellman did do this podcast too so oh, i just wow. keep plugging myself here that's... but it's pretty amazing yeah he, recently he uh i got to talk to him about that about his actors and you know the in that movie and yeah he was really generous did you talk to him about his double release on criterion yes. the shooting and ride the world yes, I did. yeah Man, that's kind beautiful. of beautiful yeah uh well yeah that kind of uh, allowed the opportunity because he he said yes he would do it just you know see those films first so we could talk about because they were just released on, by criterion um yeah terrific stuff but that was sort of the vein that we were sort of trying to hit with some beasts and, yeah. you know, trying yeah. to find that, you know, like I was, I don't know if I said this in the Q&A, but Bob Rafelson is a huge influence and like King of Marvin Gardens, mm-hmm. when they go explore Atlantic City, you know, the reason why he wanted to do that was because it was sort of like this ideal of the American dream, yet it's like completely dilapidated and exploring these American backwaters that once stood for something and now are something completely different and just exploring those through cinema is just it it was just Mm -hmm. it was something that i had worked out there and sort of knew kind of the places that i really wanted to focus on and Mm -hmm. and the mood i wanted to evoke and and the actors and non-actors i wanted to put together Mm -hmm. in the scenes and play off of each other to to find something that was truthful yet yet said something about what the American dream has become in a way, mm-hmm. how it's changed. Mm-hmm. Well, where you, since you're starting to talk about your influences and your personal way in, I'm just curious, how did you, uh, enter, like, did you grow up around movies and did, where'd you grow up? Uh, did your parents uh, introduce you to that or one of your parents or? Um, actually I came to cinema through music. The reason I was out on the farm is because we were, we had a music collective and the way I started, making movies is because I would make um, these collage films and we would project them on in, in on the wall in art galleries and we would play the music behind the audiences to and so we would play these live scores. Um, growing up my parents really weren't cinephiles or I really I was kind of the typical kid. I'd go to the to the bigger movies, but most of my time was spent outside as an only child with kind of using my imagination sure. and um you know i had friends and everything but it wasn't like i had like a big family like where we could all go out it was more just like me exploring nature by myself and right. i mean maybe that's how i how how i got the overactive imagination <laughs> absolutely sure sure yeah and in, you could see it in in frank's character what's his name uh sal sal mm-hmm. you could kind of see the he spends a lot of time by himself in nature, so mm-hmm. it's not so surprising. I, I talked to uh, Kelly Reichart too, who you should meet. I would she, love to meet her. That Kelly, would be uh, a dream come Kelly, true. Uh, <laughs> note to note to self. Uh, yes, I'll get I'll get you uh, I'll get you her email. Uh, no, uh, but but uh, she did. She and she 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 had a different uh, kind of world, but or rather childhood. But but she also explores uh, that that uh, that same kind of similar themes that we're we're talking about you know and about sort of the underbelly of of america Mm -hmm. and and the open space and she i guess had a a, 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 maybe a like a police detective father or something and interesting so like like a but like crime scene like was she was i I can't try try to remember like if she just saw it was that you know ended up seeing some crime scenes in her day but she she took a lot of trip a, road, a number of road trips with her mother like extended road trips like across great expanses of the united states and i nice. could see in her films these being you know on the road how that influenced her filmmaking and she would take pictures and as a little kid and on the road so it's like well that's what you're still doing you know that's a really good point because my my dad and i we used to take trips and mm-hmm. i he was a photographer and so that was probably another way in to filmmaking was mm-hmm, sure he taught me a lot about composition and the rule of thirds and like teaching What's with that? teaching without thinking it's 
teaching without teaching, but um, it's where the photograph um, is divided into three or to to three horizontal uh, sections, and you're sort of sp- like the traditional classical composition is to frame like a certain way, and um, so he raised me kind of with those ideas for composition in mind, and then also how to expose how to underexpose if you want to, how to use like slow and fast shutter speeds. And, mm-hmm. and he would give me his Nikon uh, that um, he and, and I would and I would take photos and he would sort of like help me and show me like what the different lenses did and all different kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So he was a huge influence on my film work. And he also gave me my first video camera right before I uh, left college to go travel the world. I went and traveled and backpacked through South America for and lived in South America. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for uh, for almost a year, and then went over to Europe and backpacked through Europe. Um, and the whole time, that was where those video collages came from. Uh, oh, that you, I that I used galleries. that I used for the music and the compositions. And um, so yeah, so it was all. Looking back on it, it all seems like it all makes sense, you know, in a weird way. Some distance now that you're talking. Hey. hey. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is not a therapy session. But, right. But happy to help. <laughs> happy to help. <laughs> uh, what, uh, where did you grow up? Where was this taking place? Uh, I grew up in Austin. Oh, you did? Mm-hmm. You grew up in, okay. And uh, I imagine even that, even though you're a very young guy, um, I don't know if quite like Slacker had quite happened in those years yet, or maybe coinciding with that. Uh, what year did it come out? 91 or 2 I don't 92 know. I think 92 maybe yeah um, that was like the year actually a couple of years after that I left Dallas and, or left Austin and moved to Dallas mm-hmm. and went to high school in Dallas but it that that Austin is the Austin that I remember which is why I love that movie so much sure. it was a very small town yeah and it had a small town feel and everyone talked with each other on this, you know, and mm-hmm. it was, it was a very personal, uh, uh, personally, it just, it just felt, it just felt good. Like a, com- like a small community. And I think that's what kind of what drew me to the small community that's in mm-hmm. the, in the film in Virginia was just this idea of like kind of everyone looking out for each other, sharing meals, having long philosophical conversations you Mm -hmm. know just kind of on or off time instead of like watching television or you know sports or something like that it was so did 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 you discover filmmakers and and watching films like through uh just on your own then like as a byproduct of gradual process or creative revolution you know like i mean i kind of did so i don't think anybody pointed it out i didn't go to film school yeah but I, I mean it took a decades the, the you know to have that kind of but i started with some of these same names but those guys like ravelson were believe it or not making movies when i was a kid like my and there wasn't a big industry for children's movies they were there were disney movies but there wasn't like there wasn't any pixar there wasn't any dreamworks there wasn't any whole industry so we saw a lot of movies as young kids teenagers we saw the same movies our parents were seeing yeah you know i mean my you know so so my point is is that i kind of had that head start in a way right with the classics because because the altman movies were coming out the cassavetes movies were coming out the ravelson movies were coming out in those days you know mm-hmm. um so i would see them in the movie theaters you know yeah. even though yeah. it's probably too young to sit through some of these right and um you know and then you get the reference oh these guys were influenced by let's say Truffaut and godard and and all these other you know french filmmakers uh and italian master you know uh rather uh, Antonioni and all these other Fellini and uh, so I, I watched them all because of I, my, my parents loved them so yeah well for me it was um, those three years that I spent in the cabin that you see on the film like with Sal were very lonely years and I would go to the library down in Blacksburg which was about a 40 minute trip mm-hmm. and I would check out basically every movie that they had and I didn't know any of these directors. Like, I watched my first Tarkovsky film without even knowing who he was. But I remember that, I mean, it was hilarious. And I remember watching it and saying, I have no, like, it just absolutely changed my entire perspective on what cinema could be. And I'm, there I am sitting on a cab, in a cabin watching this on a laptop, you know, alone mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, wow. And I'm looking outside and I'm like, this is this makes sense to me because this is basically like what's happening outside. Like there's some sort of in, there's some sort of magic um, 
that he's able to actually capture and bring into the cinema and take you there. And I, at the time, I was doing a lot of you know experimental video, and I was composing a lot of music, and I thought of cinema as the greatest art after I saw, you know, films like that, you know, films like Bresson, uh, or um, you know, Bresson's films and um, Antonioni's films, uh, and um, uh, Kurosawa. I was watching a lot of Kurosawa because they had a lot at the library. And I would... Yeah, it's really amazing stuff, right? When you start yeah, to I dig would, deep into the Kurosawa stuff, it's... Uh, Ikiru, it's Ikiru, Ikiru, there was a song, the song that he sings... Um, yeah, The Older Man. The Older Man. Yeah. I, cover, I, I covered that song at he a did, show. Man. I did. And people really responded to it when he sings... Like the song that he sings on the swing? Yeah. They really responded to it at a show that we played, and I was just so happy because I, I, I had no idea still who Kurosawa was, but uh-huh. that song affected me so deeply that I was like, I got to cover this song. So I learned it. I, I picked up my acoustic guitar, and it was like a classical acoustic guitar, so I picked it, and it was a beautiful thing, mm. and I don't think anybody knew where that song came from. Well, I'm sure. I mean, I mean, maybe they Even did. if they've seen the movie, it's still a rather obscure. Yeah, and... Um, But I mean, and so cinema after that, I was like, I have to figure out how I can do this. Like how I want to make films. I really don't care. Like if, if they, if anything ever happens with them or whatever, but this to me is the epitome of art because it is visual, it's writing, Mm -hmm. it's music, it's sound. Like it, to me, it was, it's the, um, it's the most complicated, most beautiful art form that there is. And I was like, this is what I want to devote my life to. Mm. Well, good head start there. Or rather, <laughs> good start, start I should say. You know, interesting was you were talking about, like, uh, checking out movies from the uh, the library and not really having a, a knowledge of the, the, or context for the film. It, it, it It's liberating because you don't go in with any, like, these are classics and these are, because I, I never had that experience with a lot of these movies. Like, mm-hmm. by the time I got around to Tarkovsky, Tarkovsky, rather, or, you know, some of these other, you know, world cinema greats or whatever, you know, these are, you're supposed, you know you're supposed to, like, these are the standard bearers and you have to, like, recognize their their place in the history of world cinema, you know. Sure. So it's, but it, it's kind of neat to be able to not know any of that and be exposed and to arrive exactly at where you're supposed to, intellectually, emotionally watching it, and then you, you're you're your own judge of that. You know, you don't have to go in with a pre- prejudice. And, yeah. And so I only get that when I when I'm given as a pre-screener. Sometimes when I pre-screen for like I did for a little bit for Tribeca. And now I do it for Rooftop and and. Nobody's seen these movies. Like, there's no. You don't know if you're watching the next groundbreaking director or something. So was, you have to just figure out is this good or not uh, without any. Clues. That was that was how I felt when I saw Young Bodies Heal Quickly. Uh, Did you see that yes. one? And I and I watched it and I said, this is something that is just absolutely pure and beautiful. I have no idea who where this came from but i absolutely love it and mm-hmm. i want to see all of his movies and i he we, we uh host we hosted andrew at uh oak cliff film festival mm-hmm. and um and i just i had a great conversation with him about physicality of characters and about how in some beasts is like i was like i wanted to use that sort of as a mode of expression because mm-hmm. it's like something that comes off i think that krisha which by the way we saw oh yeah oh, I would... talk about a movie that uses physicality in a way that yeah is just an art form in itself Mm -hmm. um i was just absolutely blown away with that movie i want to see it again and it's playing during my movie so (laughs) i may have to do it it did be well no i mean i know i was blown away and i was experiencing uh, some family very big family issues uh, as i still am but and uh when 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 there's a certain point where i just saw coming i'm like I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle this. Mode. I did not expect this very, very raw story. I didn't expect it. Mm-hmm. So when I was sitting, have you seen it? Yeah, oh, you, you saw it together? Yeah. Um, yeah. But when I started, and it's from your neck of the woods too, right, Dallas? Yeah. So, oh no, Houston. Houston. Houston, Houston. Right, Houston. I keep forgetting. Uh-huh. So so I kept, uh, and I, at a certain point I'm like, oh shit. And then they bring out the great grandmother and I just lost oh. it because she was just so, there was just something. And then Kreisha's expression and i've talked about the film already on this film i mean on this podcast so uh, but it's glad finally uh, now it's starting to 
creep it's, into the world slowly, slowly. I was hoping Trey Schultz might be here, but I don't think he's here. I haven't seen him. I can't wait to meet him and just yeah. shake his hand and thank him for that movie. Oh, wow, yeah. yeah. Well, if you're listening, there's another one. We'll, we'll have to make sure that he's he, he uh, sees some beasts. So I'm sure he'll he'll really love it. And uh, I didn't want to, there are some other th- uh, things going on with the film in terms of the storyline, but the truth of the matter is is that it's you just kind of have to see it. You don't want to give away. It's not like there's a big mystery to it, but uh, you do understand the reference of the name at a certain point in the film late on. And, mm-hmm. and there is a subplot involving a uh, another uh, younger, also, uh, um, I don't know, outlier type. Uh, what would you call him? He's like a, another outsider type. He is. He's this young boy who's. He's this young boy who's sort of, yeah, runaway who, who seems like he's in the woods. kind of moving from. He's either between living in the woods or kind of, uh, squatting in houses. Right. Um, which I used to caretake houses uh-huh. uh, when I was up there for families that were like away in the winter, uh-huh. and it was weird when you would hear a sound in a house, and you, oh, were, yes. you were kind of wondering if, you know, because there was there were people around who would find out that people were leaving and sure and squat in houses and yeah, so that was sort of where that, that you know yeah uh uh it's a comedy okay uh but it's about these two guys who are but they 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 it's in the catskills i think and they're okay they, there's no they're not caretakers though they 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 just they they break into houses and cuz everybody's away you know mm-hmm. uh during the winter and so <laughs> but anyway they they break into houses is my point and yeah. uh, you know it's a comedy though cuz it's uh I, I guess you know it's the flip side of what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Just but that was um, it was an important thing because for me to sort of talk about on this film, there's a lot of there are, there are a lot of kind of themes and mm-hmm. and ideas that that played out over my time there that that have made it into the film and that got cut from the film. Yeah. So, yeah, like so, music was a big part, and there oh, is okay. a, there is a part. Yeah, like, I noticed that with Gary when he's playing. Yes. In music barn. in the barn yeah it's sort of this really good music very yeah. big moment and and uh to me there was there was another moment like where there were, where he was drumming that got cut and it was a very intense sort of drumming scene and it like played in sort of like intercut with this other scene it was good but it was one of those things where yeah. it would you go back to Krisha? do yeah. you think about this at the uh the way that you sound in that yeah. also right Absolutely, it reminded it really me. Worked. There was like parts that reminded me of Punch Drunk Love. Yeah, but, that's, yeah, that's but, the reference I bring up too. Yeah, yeah. But there was, but that that uh, that composer also, I believe, didn't he work on a teacher too? Pretty sure. On which one? On on a teacher. Oh, a teacher. Yes, I think you're right. Yeah, and his his scores have always just been have blown me away. I mm-hmm. mean, he he the the way that he picks out instrumentation to mm-hmm. sort of bring out uh, parts of scenes is just it's really. Um, uh, he's really intuitive and, and there's not, there, there are composers and then there are film composers and that he is, he is a true film composer in that he sees the work and can actually like enhance the work. Mm -hmm. So I was very impressed. Yeah. And, and also the range because he has some, um, you know, like there are cello glissandos that are just like very slow and, you know, very ambient. And then Mm -hmm. he has the complete opposite. Right. In kind of jarring. Jarring, very yeah. intrusive level of, of noise, like like punch drunk love, did, exactly uh, constant basis, yeah, yeah, and it adds to the tension oh, so right, well, so well, and as does the camera movement. I mean, which normally you might get, oh, it's too busy, but it, there's something about it works the chaos that it brings and the tension, as you put it. It just was uh, remarkable. Yeah. First time feature, also, it's just, yeah, I don't know, yeah. like how they knew certain things would work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? It was risky, and it, all the risks like totally paid, paid off. off. Yeah, they did. Yeah. That's rare. <laughs> yeah. So tell me where um, I guess uh, some beasts uh, will be. You, see, you mentioned a few more festivals coming up. You have a lot of festivals booked. It seems uh, to be a very festival. No, no. Oh, okay, not yet. So we're out to a lot. Never of mind places. what I just und- <laughs> uh, right. ignore what I just said. Let's back up. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, uh, you kind of made it through us. Uh, have, have you done? You did a few though so far, right? We've done Dal- Dallas and Dallas. Nashville is like what we have so far. Okay. Yeah. So and uh, you so you're submitting still. Yeah, we're definitely saying? still in the submission stage, okay. and we're mm-hmm. sort of we're being very careful about you know who we submit to, and just you know we want to definitely like have, um, it, you know the film is it's a it's a slow art film you know yeah, sure it's but at the same time it's for me and the 
and the feedback that I keep getting is it's one that needs to be seen on the big screen. And the DCP of this film and the 5.1 surround are so important to uh, to have the – it's an experiential film is another thing that I've, uh, I keep hearing. And I think that that's a big part of mm-hmm. the experience. And so um, having as many screenings in actual cinemas is going to be, I think, really important for right, us. And that, that- well, the first part of that is obviously festivals because mm-hmm. there's no saying, you know, there's no, obviously, um, uh, I don't know, uh, no given for in terms of theatricals and all that. There's, that's, Oh, that's yeah, a, we have, we other, have no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, we're definitely, we understand the state yeah. of the theatrical. I mean, the, the good news is, though, is that we did do the IFP narrative film labs, and so we're eligible to apply for the IFP screen forward. Which yeah, 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 you, exactly. Yeah. yeah which, which Leah Meyerhoff is, is going to be doing. Um, with uh, she's gonna be with, showing unicorns. With that, unicorns, that, that awesome! There. Yeah, and Elf for Leisure is coming up, uh, which is another great film from these LA guys. Uh, nice. So, but you know that would be great. You know we 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 could probably help that along. You get the yeah. whatever it's worth. The film max endorsement. I don't know if it'll it'll at, be the final, but you know we're out to rooftop too. Okay. So. Did you have a short there ever? Was no, I okay. did not have a short. But um, Krisha did play. It was a short first. Uh, and it did, yeah. You said you saw that right. Uh, yes. Okay, and it 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 uh, played at rooftop, so that I think that part of their agreement is that if it's if you do a, a feature version, is it it's you're, you're playing at a rooftop. It's sort of like nice. So it That's will great. be there as well. And um, I've been in touch now with Krisha, who I met and <laughs> had a nervous breakdown when I met her. So she she now calls me the crying man because oh wow. But we had, we had kind of all. I went to their little post party at lunch thing. Uh, and talk to her for a while, and uh, we've since been in touch, like occasionally on on you know social media, and then you know kind of writing notes to each other. Nice. Um, and uh, but so I hope that we get a chance to all meet again. She lives in Mexico. Oh, okay. She's sort of one of these expats who've like you know moved down to Mexico, you know, and lives down there, makes baskets, that kind of thing. You know. How and, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So he and she's an actor. And, she was, and I guess she's now coming back because okay. I think she's getting calls. Yeah, and her sister who was who was not an actress, but she was just dynamite. The one who plays Trey's mother, who's actually yeah. uh, sorry, uh, plays his aunt. Aunt, yeah. In the movie, is actually his mother. Oh, okay. and Krisha is actually his aunt. I see. And plays his mother. I see. Wow, how interesting. And it was a real person in their family. It was a man. Okay. Who, who that was based on, and who who died. Oh wow! So they were all coming off that as well. Wow! Like this family and they made this film, so it's a pretty intense situation. And then of course they used some local actors. Right, right, right. Like Chris Dubeck and uh, I Bill love, Wise. And, I love Chris Dubeck. Yeah, and yeah, I have another uh, episode to post with him from this South by uh, with him and Bill Wise and um and Heather and Johnny. Uh, so it's nice to to kind of just have uh, eventually hear all the different perspectives on. These these film projects that are they, I think there's just seems to be a spate of great movies, and it's exciting to me. I'm a, a, at least a generation or two older than you are, but to see the um, it's still every time to talk and find out the the influences uh, rem- still, you know, it, everybody sees, keeps coming back to these similar, you know. So what, all that says to me is is not that everybody. You know, like I was suggesting earlier, where you kind of told who you need to go to, right? But, but I think it's a natural thing where you, you know, because they told real stories about and it was all character driven mm-hmm. and story driven, yeah. You know, ultimately, and so even though a lot of filmmakers, quote unquote, sell out, I suppose, and uh-huh. make some Hollywood big, you know, blockbuster type film, but th- I think still in all, people go back to these stories, and we need these stories because they're. There, it reflects the real human condition, and you know, it, it, when you see it, it's a transcendent experience. When you see it with like some beasts, or uh, Cretia, or uh, uh, King of Marvin Gardens, whatever it is, you know, it's like these are transcendent uh, films. You come out changed, you know. I yeah, think, at some level, yeah. there's an authenticity to them yeah. that just um, when I was growing up in the era of '80s and '90s movies, you know, they're harder to find. 
in that era. And I feel yeah. like that's the reason why there's so many filmmakers from my generation who are going back to the 70s. Yeah. And um, and we start, I feel like a lot of us start with the 60s, yeah. you know, like yeah. with the French New Wave and, and the then, Italian neorealism. Sure, you know? yeah, I yeah. mean, Rossellini uh, has a huge part to play in, <laughs> in Beast Visconti. and sort of, yeah, Visconti and uh, Bertolucci to some extent, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, he was I'm, on this too. I can't, I'll start really? Like, yeah, believe it or not, I talked to Bertolucci. That's amazing. You have to go back and listen. Yeah. That's amazing. It was a Skype call, but. Yeah, he was at his new movie. Recently. Wow. He had a movie out recently. Yeah, it was recently. Is it the one with the brother and the sister? Mm-hmm. Nice. E- e- Ute. E- I, e- I really e- wanted to see that, and it hasn't been. I don't. I can't. I don't know what oh, it is. Oh, it's maybe. I don't know if it's available. You're right. But it was. Uh, but he directed it like in, his, in a wheelchair, right? And that was like one of the big things I read in Film Comment was that yeah, he was. Yeah, he, was been, he, was, he had been sick, you know, and yeah. he retired. And right. then he just was, I guess, getting so depressed. He realized I have, to, I can't do, I can't keep going on like this. He said it in, with it, in Italian, though. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, and then so he finally just decided to do a little movie, right? All inside of this, you know, basement, basically of this house or building, and uh, with these two characters, and you know, and it brought him back to life. He said, and it's meant. He doesn't care if people watch it on a t- uh, computer or on a watch. He says, Wow. So he says. But, uh, but yeah, the re- the reason I brought it up is because, you know, there's usually so much motion in dollies and in this movie. And I hear that this is like one film where it's like there's a lot of static shots and a lot of just wide shots and very, it's very still. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was very interesting that, yeah. you know, you, you know, there's so many directors that like are have a style, but like with it seems to me like he's just staying true to who he is. Mm-hmm. And that's like that was really refreshing to hear. It's nice. Yeah. Well, he's made some very big, expansive movies. I know. So I think he yeah. probably tried to take that to the intimate story mm-hmm. kind of approach. I don't know. Well, um, so hopefully we'll we'll see you in New York this summer. Yeah, I would love to be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice meeting you. It was great uh, meeting you too. Yeah, man. thanks for doing this, and um, we'll look for big things from you and from the film, and hopefully we'll come back on. I would love anytime. to do it. Yeah. That was that was great. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, everybody. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter, at Film Wax Radio. We are on Facebook, at Facebook.com slash Film Wax Radio, of course. We have a website, and it's called FilmWaxRadio.com. You can find episodes on iTunes, of course. Please go and subscribe. Leave us a nice uh, comment and star rating. I always ask for that, but it's really important. And also, we are available for streaming off of Stitcher and YouTube as well. And I'm going to be looking soon to get us on Spotify and SoundCloud and everything else. But baby steps. Be back in a few days with a brand new episode, of course. Who's coming up here? We've got another wonderful episode coming up with... I've got uh, Karen Cooper, who has been with Film Forum forever. We've got episode coming up with Bob Hawke, film champion extraordinaire. We've got... Uh, Abel Ferrar is still to post. Uh, I've got F- WFMU personality Clay Pigeon and filmmaker Rachel Schumann, who have a documentary out called One October. Uh, we'll be posting that shortly. Their film is about to go to the Lighthouse International Film Festival as well as the Cape Cod Film Festival, so we're going to get that up in a little bit. Leo Roshovsky and Todd Soliday with their new documentary. It's called Big Sonia. Very entertaining film. And uh, can't wait to play that for you, along with Women You Should Know which is an organization which basically champions projects by women. And then they have another uh, area called, uh, another component to their business called Women You Should Fund, which is now a new crowdsourced platform, which Big Sonia is taking advantage of right now. We'll tell you more about that in the next episode or two of the podcast. Also coming up is Lorenzo Fiuzzi, who is this nice young Italian gentleman who has a uh, streaming platform, which we're going to tell you all about called Cinematique, and you can subscribe to it for a very low fee and see uh, all these great international films that you don't get to see anywhere else because they often don't even get to the United States. It's a fantastic idea. And we'll have Lorenzo on in, the, I think, maybe either the next episode or the one just after. We're going to get those up. Then we also have an, an, an entire episode devoted to the Maryland recent Maryland Film Festival, just finished a few days ago, including interviews with Skiz Sizik, and Eric Hatch, who are with the festival. 
I've got another interview from there with Stanley Nelson, who is returning to the podcast with his new documentary, Tell Them We Are Rising, the story of black colleges and universities. Also a young filmmaker from uh, Baltimore named Theo Anthony, who has a this amazing film, which you're going to hear a lot about um, as it comes into New York this summer, called Rat Film. And uh, we have him coming up on the show. And then uh, a little bit down in the next few weeks, we're also going to have Lara Stallman, who is the filmmaker behind a new documentary called Swim Team. So, guys, uh, you know, I'm doing my best here to bring in as many interesting folks as possible to the show. So continue to please stay tuned tune to the show and the best way again is going on iTunes and uh, subscribing thank you very much uh, Film Wax Radio is part of the Showbriz Studios podcast network you should check them out they've got a gr- bunch of great shows including the David Feldman show there's the Carson show which is a, this a podcast devoted to bringing on guests who all knew Johnny Carson and each each episode is there these amazing anecdotes so check out that and there's got a bunch more shows all part of the show Briz Studios podcast network and then we're also presented by Rooftop Films our our friends and partners uh, at the Rooftop Films which again opens their 21st season tomorrow night at the old American Can Factory here in Squamish Brooklyn So we'll see you there. I'll be there and this weekend, and I look forward to seeing everybody. Okay, everybody, take care of yourself, please, and the ones you love. Until next time.